We are going to get started tonight. We got a lot to cover. Uh, I told you as we uh, continue in this class too, uh, there will be a little bit more um, class involvement and discussion. And so you're going to see some of that tonight. And just a second. All right, there we go. Uh, well, you're going to see some of that tonight. And uh, I just want to start with prayer tonight. Lord, we just pray tonight that you would illuminate your word. It is my heart and my passion, Lord, that I believe that this is, in my opinion, the most important topic in the Bible uh, because it's what makes the Bible come alive. It was, it's what pushes us back to you as king. It's what gives us and shows us our purpose and intent on earth. It's what pushes us towards freedom. It's what uh, shows us our authority over the enemy. It's what shows us the access uh, to different areas of your kingdom that we have and that you've given us. And so I pray tonight, Lord, illuminate your word. I pray there would be nothing that is spoke, Lord, that would be of opinion. But I pray that everything that is spoke tonight, Lord, would be straight out of your word. And we would have fun tonight dissecting your word, Lord, as it dissects us, as it cuts into our heart. Uh, and Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that we would even be challenged in some areas. You'd make us think. I pray that you would uh, equip us to reach a dying generation that's out there, that's confused, God, that's confused culturally, that's confused sexually, that's confused politically, God. And there's all areas of life where we see this confusion, which we know is of the enemy because you tell us he is the author of that confusion. And they need an answer, and the answer is you, Jesus. And you've given us principles in your kingdom, which we know is keys of your kingdom, which work if we understand how to work them. So illuminate your word tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 I heard somebody knocking. I was like, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. <laughs> Sorry. We can't come in. You can come in. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with a very, very deep dad joke today. What did Jeremiah's parents do in the Bible for a living? Does anybody know? I don't know, but they had a small prophet. <laughs> I heard that today, and I thought that was funny. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Yeah, all right. The priority of the kingdom. This is what we began to talk about last week. And last week, I gave you keys. If you didn't get a key, you can get one off the table today before you leave. And I gave you a bookmark. And I taught you and I told you that the bookmark is to teach and show you God never intended you to get saved so it would just be us four and no more. He never intended for you to be saved, to be silent, to just come and fill yourself full of knowledge that you go and do nothing with. He intended you to go change the world. And sometimes that means your neighborhood. Sometimes that's the neighbor across the street. Sometimes that's your, your place of work or employment. Sometimes that's your family. Whenever I got saved, the thing that God told me was he said, uh, when he saved me, he said, you'll redeem your family name. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. Uh, but I would learn very, very quickly what that meant. My family, when I got saved, uh, we were heathens. Like when our family got saved, I'm sure the devil was like, man, we lost a good one today. Like we were, we were not what you would say uh, followers of Christ. Um, my stepmom actually got saved first, and her and my dad, they uh, was going to church, and they fell away there for a little while. Um, but I didn't know anyone outside of just a few of us was saved with our last name. And I was went to Bible college in Columbus, and then I... I finished up, we graduated there. I went to continue my education in Springfield, Missouri. I was at a Bible college there. I was at one of the larger Assembly of God churches uh, one Sunday for service because we was attending church there. And the pastor said, turn around and shake hands with the person behind you as you're seated today and tell them it's good to see them. Introduce yourself. And I turned around and I said, my name is Don Castleberry. And this guy said, my name is Brian Castleberry. And I was like, I was like, what? And standing next to him was his dad. And his dad's name was Joe Castleberry. And Joe Castleberry is the guy I actually ended up spending time talking to. And Joe Castleberry, he began to tell me, he's like, so who are you from? And I was like, I don't know if you know any of my people. And so I began to, to give names. And he said, I know some of them. And I was like, what? 
I was like, there's another Castleberry in church. And I was waiting for the roof of the church to fall in. <laughs> it didn't happen. But what I learned that day was he was the president at the time of AGTS, which was the theological seminary down there. And now he's the president of one of the larger Bible colleges for the Assemblies of God called Northwestern Assembly of God University out on the West Coast. And he began to give me my family legacy. He said, listen, this is what happened. When the Castleberries came uh, to America, that actually wasn't our last name. Our last name was Castleberg, and we were German, and they couldn't find a job, and nobody wanted them here. And so they had arrived, and they went to William Penn's area, and they began to get a job at his, his paper factory is where he, he was at. And he said they had 10 kids, and they were all grown kids, and the family could not sustain to support them, so they sent five of them west and five of them south. And the five that went south was all missionaries and ministers, and they were very uh, influential in the assemblies of God. But the five that went west were prostitutes and thieves and drug addicts, and I was like, that sounds familiar. And I was like, I know where I come from. And so he said, it hit me like what God was saying. He said, you're going to redeem your family name. And since then, I've led uh, sisters to the Lord. I've led nieces to the Lord. I've led cousins to the Lord. Um, and I've got to see God do a pretty cool thing. Um, as I've un uncovered principles of the kingdom that work if you work the principles. So I taught you last week the purpose of a key. A key is, a uh, principle is like a key, right? And I said, put this somewhere where you know where it's at. And I said, if you didn't get one, they have them on the table up here. But a lot of people, they tied these on the bookmark of their Bible. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, you have been given authority. You have. Whenever you was created, uh, you need to know this. When man was created, God gave man authority on earth. He said he gives us dominion on earth. And so how he moves on earth is through delegated authority of mankind. That's how he moves on earth. So when you remain silent, you rob God of authority. Think about that. When you are obedient and you pray, and when you are obedient and you exercise the word, God's moving through your life on earth, and this is what's called an anointing. It, it rests and it sets upon you. He gives you a grace, an anointing to do his work. And so he's about kingdom business. But I want to start tonight. I want to ask this question uh, and answer this question, why kingdom culture? But before we do that, let me ask you guys this question. This is going to be uh, audience participation here. What shapes culture? Throw, throw some things at me that shape culture. The people. people, okay. Somebody else? People. Religion. What, religion? Okay. Territory. Territory. If I abbreviate, it's because I don't know how to spell the word. All right. <laughs> what else? What, what else? Weather. Weather? What else? Attitude. Attitude. What else? History. History. What else? Family. Family. What else? Social media. Social media? Government. What else? Military. Military. Keep coming. What, what's that? Race. Race. Anything else you can think of? Shapes culture? Huh? Customs. Customs. Anything else? Entertainment. I do know how to spell this, but I'm going to abbreviate this. <laughs> this is a long word. What else? Education. Education. That's a good one. I'm going to abbreviate that too. What else? These are all good. Is that it? I'd add media. We said social media. 
I think media shapes culture, right? Anything else you can think of? Is that a pretty exhaustive list? Okay, this is important. Okay, so who shapes culture? Let me ask you that. Who, who shapes culture? Who? We do. What'd you say? People with the loudest mouths. <laughs> <laughs> Annette, what'd you say? Okay. People with money. Ooh. So I'll just say money. Educational system. What else? Yep, we got that one. Yep. You know, it says influence down here. Yep, somebody said that over here. What'd you say? Sure. Should. Media. Somebody said entertainers. I would agree with that. I would say youth sometimes. Youth? Yes. Anybody else? I would say teachers. We got a lot of ungodly teachers and colleges. Okay. And this is funny when good teachers. Okay. <laughs> Okay, what, who else? Is that pretty exhaustive? All right, so let me ask you this. All this is right. And we could go on, you could see this, we could exhaust this thing. We could go on and we could fill this whole board up with stuff at what shapes culture. The reason this is so important, right, is because we know the shape that our culture is in. And here's the problem with the church. I'm just going to be honest. Most of the time, we don't know how to handle culture. So there's a book... And I'm not showing you this to tell you to go buy a book. I'm, I'm t showing you this to show you. This is where we're at in America, okay? There's books coming out like this book, right? And, and this is a book that I bought. Um, and it's on culture issues, right? It's on like transgender stuff, homosexuality. It's on truth, politics, abortion, um, the environment, education, entertainment. And this book's called Culture Shock. And it's talking about how the church is to relate to culture. Um, but it hit me because we're at a place where we're, we're trying to tell the church, hey, culture's important. You might want to pay attention to what's going on around you. So let me ask you this question. Kingdom culture, who shapes kingdom culture? The Bible. The Bible? <clears throat> Pastor, give me the look. What were you going to say? I wouldn't say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Who shapes kingdom culture? Well, aren't we supposed to be shaping it? God does. God does? Now Jesus does. What's your thought, Pastor? <laughs> <laughs> What's your thought? Uh, who shapes kingdom culture? Who shapes kingdom culture? Well, God initiates it, but we carry it. So... It's got to be us. Okay. I think your sentence is accurate. The king shapes the culture, but we carry the culture. You cannot have cult culture will always point back to the person that we placed in power, in control of that, right? So here, here's why all these laws are passing in. Yep, go. Uh, now I got it. All right, so what we're identifying then are kings. Correct. Those would be like little kings. Yes. That shape culture. Little kings shape culture. Somebody said, and they said it laughingly, but people with the loudest mouths. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that. But they're little kings. Look at these people. They have money. They have influence. You know who doesn't shape culture usually? People that don't have these things. Right. They don't have position. 
they get pushed into a culture that they did not shape often. If you don't believe that, all you got to do is go back and look at how the projects was created back in the day. It was a culture that was created that people were forced into because they didn't have this stuff sometimes. They didn't have the access to this stuff sometimes. And so there was a culture that was created that they were forced into. Now they created a culture out of that because even in a poor culture, it creates hierarchy. Does that make sense? So you can go to the poorest nation on earth. Here, I'll show you how that works in a very practical way. So the last church I was on staff at was led by Native Americans. And one of the things they talked about, you know what runs a reservation? Financially, you know what runs reservations? Casinos. Did you know usually when a casino comes in, it's ran by one family? And that family dictates what the money does and where it goes. And this is why most of your reservations are still full of drugs and alcohol and that they're poor. But you'll see one family that's stupid wealthy because they're supposed to disseminate that wealth amongst the people, but they're dictators. They don't do that, but they create the culture. And then they complain about the culture that they create. We are seeing in America that there's a culture shift because these little kings have ruled our lives. But the kingdom of God is totally opposite. He didn't get voted in. He doesn't get voted out. He didn't ask your opinion. He doesn't care what your opinion is on his culture of what he does. In fact, what religion does is religion always takes the position that Jesus gives you and it tries to lower you in the kingdom. That's what religion does. So let me show you what that looks like. In the Bible, Jesus calls you and I his, his ambassadors. But religion will always tell you you're not qualified. It'll always try to put labels on you. Jesus says you are qualified because you're my ambassador. And if he, he, if he dubbed you his ambassador, that means this. You need to know what his culture is because the territory that you're called to lead, you'll lead out of this stuff rather than this stuff. And he goes, that's opposite. See, the kingdom of heaven, the culture of heaven is totally opposite. It's like flipped upside down to what you would see on earth. Examples. Romans 12, 1, 2, it says, Be no longer conformed to the what? Pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? The renewal of your mind. So what's that look like? On earth, they tell you the way to get rich is you've got to you got to think of yourself. you got to store up things for yourself. The kingdom is the opposite of that. You know how you find wealth in the kingdom? You give it away. You know how you find power in the kingdom? The lowest person, God exalts. You know how you find power on earth? you got to be the loudest mouth. you got to be at the top. you got to make for sure they know who you are. Jesus is the opposite of that. The earth, they walk in pride. The kingdom, they walk in humility. And I can show you just principle after principle of how this works if we work this. But what we choose to do too often is we allow these little kings, and I'm going to show you this tonight, these little kings to rule our lives. So what you have to know is this. Most everything that we see on earth, we're not fighting with an individual. We're fighting with an enemy. And the enemy is not your wife, it's not your husband, it's not your dog. The enemy is the enemy. And he has tactics and he has plans and people that think he's stupid, he's not stupid, he's smart. He's done this a long, a long time. He knows how to keep people in bondage. He knows how to keep families in bondage. And he will lay back like a snake in the corner and he'll wait for the opportune moment to take you out. And so you have, to, you have to understand the authority you've been given. In your notes it says this, and I fell in love with this quote when I read it. This is by uh, Jimmy Evans. Jimmy Evans is down at Gateway Church. He said this, Mercy without truth is a cheerleader without a team, and truth without mercy is a surgeon without anesthesia. Think about that. Most Christians fall into one of those two categories, right? They're, they have mercy, but they have no truth. And those are the people that's like, 
We've just got to learn to embrace people. Maybe not. Sometimes you got to learn how to, if somebody doesn't want to change, you got to learn how to distance yourself from that person. But then there's the flip side of that. Truth without mercy is a surgeon without anesthesia. Those are the people that just want to cut you with the word. And that's not helpful either. That's why I love our motto that's on the wall in the sanctuary. Simply said, God loves you. Everything we should do should be laced with the love of God. People should know when they're corrected, when they're directed, that it's all coming from a place of the love of God. So I told you guys last week, every human desires these two things. They desire power and they desire purpose. And if you don't believe you desire these two things, uh, you want these in your own life. You want to have control of your life and you want to know what the purpose of your life is. Everybody wants this. And if you don't think you want power or control over your life, you haven't figured out we don't die well yet very easily, right? Like we love us some us. That's what I like to tell people all the time. And so, um, and then with that comes purpose. And what, what, what you'll find out in life is if, if you do not discover your purpose in Christ, you will become your own purpose. You'll make everything about you. And that is totally opposite to what uh, we see in the kingdom. And then seven ways, and I went over this, this is in your notes from last week, seven ways that man seeks purpose and power is religion. We try to find it in religion. Politics, money, fame, notoriety, recognition, and influence. Those are the areas. And pastor, like you were saying with this stuff, you could call these here little kings too. Because these are little kings that rule the earth. And they try to get, here's the thing, they try to teach you your identity. The only way you can find your identity is in Christ. That's it. Because he made you. And what the world is doing and why we're writing books like this is because we're trying to recreate identity and tell people what identity is, right? So it's no longer the birds and the bees. I was joking about this with Pastor earlier this week, but now it's the birds and the birds and the bees and the bees and the birds that think they're bees, right? And the bees that think they're birds. And you're like, what? What's happened is... When I see somebody that comes out and they say they're transgender, this is what I say. No, they're not. They're confused. They're confused in their identity, and their identity, there's a wire that's got crossed in their identity somewhere. And that could be trauma. That could be deception. Usually it's many things. And you can unwire that, and you can always fix that if you can go back and you can figure out they're not the enemy. We were going through a drive through in our hometown, and uh, we get, get up to pay for our food, and we go to the next window, and this guy goes to hand us our food, and he's got hair like a woman, and nails like a woman, and makeup like a woman, and society would say, well, you need to address this guy like a woman. That's not a woman. That's a guy. And so what you have to do is you have to understand there's two types of people, Right? There's birds and bees. That's, that's what there is. It doesn't matter what culture says. It matters what kingdom says. We can't change on what Jesus says. But you have to learn how to handle that stuff with love and wisdom. Because here's the thing. If all you're adamant about is proving your point, but you drive them away from your table, you've lost the voice in their life. But if all you're, you're adamant about is keeping them at the table, you've lost the authority in your life. Right. You have to have influence and you have to have authority if you want to see people changed. Jesus was a master of this. He sat at a well with a woman, and, and, and her story's often mistaught because we often say she was like a harlot, right? It's the woman at the well where he says, you know, who's your husband? And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, yeah, you speak correctly. You know, you, you don't have a husband. A lot of people like, oh, she must have slept around and all of her husbands died and all this stuff. Really what happened was this, if you actually study this out with what most theologians teach, all of her husbands had died in the past and she was in a place where no one wanted her now. And so not even the brothers wanted her now because they realized this didn't work out very good for our last four brothers. Every time you got hooked up with them, they ended up dead. You're still alive. 
not a good solution. We don't want you in our house. And so she's, one of them takes her in. She's broken. Jesus meets her at her most desperate place, right? Going back to our opening quote, he shows her mercy. He reveals to her truth. He does it with love, and her heart changes. And he takes a key to the kingdom, and he literally unlocks something in this woman to where pff, her eyes are opened. I think that story shows kind of what our series a few years ago of love is understanding kind of proved. And Jesus took the time to not just point out the flaws. That's good. But, con but converse and have conversation and show that there was understanding in the, in, in the conversation. And I think in our culture today, especially when it comes to kingdom versus the things that we're talking about, you know, the hot topics, is, is that we, the church has to engage culture not to approve it or to affirm it, but to engage it to bring kingdom to it. Yes. And, and that story that you just shared, I think there's no greater example than to go to a place that was forbidden for Jews to speak to someone who was forbidden for a Jewish man to talk to. And yet we see that story as a great example of how we are to engage this difficult culture that we find ourselves in. I like what you said, too. Because this is, and don't miss this, guys, like time is essentially key. Very seldom does God send you to somebody to unlock something in their life where you don't have, where you haven't spent time with them. God is a God of relationship. Yeah. And a lot of the times what we do is we try to exercise our authority at tables where we do not have influence. <coughs> we want to tell somebody over there how to live their life, but we have, we have invested nothing in that individual. And usually what you do when you do that, I'm just trying to help you, is you usually do more damage than good. The only time that works is when the Holy Spirit sends you that way. And you need to know that's the Holy Spirit sending you that way. And you still need to do it in love because what you said, Pastor, I think is so essential. There's a time element that's involved in all of that. But when you listen to Jesus, and I love that series that we did, because we, we have up here race, right? Can I tell you, racism is taught. All racism is taught. I used to teach this at a church in Omaha. You're never born racist, right? Racism is taught. It's bred into generations. And can I tell you, it's sin. When Jesus looks at race, he sees the human race. That's who he sees. And that's who, how we should live our lives. And so we should go to bat for those that are our brothers and sisters. And I don't just mean Christians. When we were in uh, Bible college in Columbus, um, the major um, outreach that we did, and we sent millions of dollars because we heard the plight of what was taking place in Sudan. And they went to our American government and they asked them to stand up and stop the atrocity of what was taking place to those people, and this is what our government said, it does not benefit us. But the church didn't say that. The church said, it's our mission, it's our assignment, it's our job. That's our assignment. And so what you're saying, Pastor, there is no greater example of that, I think, because that crossed lines of race, that crossed lines of uh, socioeconomics, that cr crossed lines of approval. I mean, if you looked on this board, that would cross a lot of these lines. Religion. And Jesus was never about bowing to the world's kings or system. The enemy even tried to get him to do so. And we'll talk about that later. Uh, and then I put in there the seven, uh, seven things to find... Uh, Oh, I'm going to back up here real quick. The greatest secret to living effectively on earth is understanding the principal power of priorities. I want you guys to understand this. How would you define what, what a priority is in your life? What did you say? Where it lines up in order of importance. Okay, and you said what's most important. 
Okay. Priority. How do you know what's a priority in your life? Okay. What you read. I think all those things. I think what Pastor said is the number one key. Where you spend your time shows what your priority is. Whether that's first or whether that's last. Because can I tell you, you can have some priorities in your life that are not as big of priorities as other priorities, but they're still priorities. And what I mean by that is this. The greatest gift that God has given you on earth, of course, is salvation. I mean, we could go that, that route because that's all true. Um, but do you realize one of the greatest things God's ever given you on earth is time? Because you trade your time to live. It's called a job. You do that for years. You trade your time uh, for different things with people. And can I tell you, money you can get back, relationships you can fix and get back. Time is the one thing when you spend, you don't get it back. It's gone. Your time is incredibly valuable. So if you really want to know the top two things that you can look at and go, what is the priorities in my life? Where you spend your time and where you spend your money? Because your money reflects your time. And whenever it talks about redeeming time, did you know one of the ways you can redeem time is when somebody blesses you with money because it's time that you did not have to spend to go earn that money? And so it's a way where time has been redeemed to you where you have a blessing now and God holds you responsible for that. If you just go and blow that, God goes, that wasn't what that was for. God goes, I redeemed something to you. I gave you something. What will you do with that? So you've got to watch what you do with your time. So this is one way you can watch what you do with your time. You can take a picture of this because um, this isn't in your notes. But I used, I used to walk college kids through this all the time. They would tell me what their priorities was, right? And I would make them do this. is called a, uh, a daily timeline. And so they would, I, we would draw this out on a big whiteboard. And uh, it would start with 12 a.m. And I got it going to 3 p.m. But it would go all the way down to 12 p.m. And I would have them, each one, I would have them do this. They'd have to map out their week. What they literally did, so it would say like sleep, 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 right? And some of them, because they're guys, would sleep down to here, right? Like, and it was like, dude, you see what your priority is. Your priority is sleeping. It's no wonder you're, you're flunking your classes. Uh, but what amazes you is there's things in your life that you think is a priority that when you do this, you realize really isn't that big of a priority to you. And you know what's really scary? Often one of the largest things in that is our relationship with Christ. Do you realize that Pastor and I, we were talking about this. If the only growth, and I know this isn't you guys because you guys are coming to class, you're being discipled. But, <laughs> but if the average Christian, if the only time they're, they're giving Christ is when they come to church on Sunday morning, on average, say Pastor preached an hour every week, that's 52 hours a year that they're building a relationship with Jesus. And just say they decided to come to every single Wednesday night, 52 Wednesday nights a year. And that's not counting holidays, where we're taking out of there. So it's 104 hours they're investing in their spiritual life for the year. You know how many hours are in a year? That's not even a tithe for the year. And we wonder why the American church is so depleted and so powerless. But we can tell you what was on season two of our favorite show, right? We, we, can tell you, we can tell you sometimes things that's taking place in the community, events, and environments. And I'm not saying any of that's bad. Hear my heart. I'm saying Christ looks at us and he goes, how much of a priority am I in your life? This is what we was talking about, Lori, in the beginning. When somebody comes to you and they're like, how, how do you hear Jesus? The number one way that I would answer that is this, time. You got to spend time with Jesus to hear Jesus. Because often he doesn't come to you with the loud mouth. He comes to you in a whisper and he goes, hey, don't do that. And he nudges you and he pulls you away and he wakes you up in the middle of the night and he goes, hey, I need to talk to you for a minute. 
and you're reading his word, and he goes, hey, did you see that? Hey, did you notice that? And then it develops a relationship where you know his voice. So, in our lives, we all have what I would call an, an internal bookshelf, right? So if, picture this being you, right? Like your body is like a big bookshelf on the inside. Everything you do in life is like putting a book inside of here. Relationships, TV shows you like, songs you like. It's crazy how you can still remember lyrics from a song in the 70s, but you have a hard time remembering a Bible verse, right? You know why that is? Priority. It was a priority that you memorized that back then. And so all of this stuff is gauged and is staged in your life. But if you really looked at most people's lives, uh, or, or Saul, I'll just say this first. And this is what John 14, 26 says, But the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all things that I have said unto you. In other words, this. This is how the Holy Spirit works, okay? He's a gentleman. He doesn't force you to do anything, ever. And anybody that teaches the Holy Spirit forces you to do something, that's not biblical. What he does, he literally goes to the shelf where he spoke, and he knows where everything's filed, and he can pull that off, and he can go, hey, remember when I spoke this to you here? And I cannot say this adamantly enough. This is why journaling is so important. Because I know you don't, you, you may be better than me, and you don't forget anything, right? Uh, but there's times where God says, you need to go pull your journal off the shelf. Mm -hmm. And I'll go pull my journal, and he goes, flip back through there and I'll start flipping and then boom, he'll show me something. Remember when I spoke to you to this? I'm seeing things fulfilled in my life right now that God spoke to me 20 years ago. You have to write down your story. Not to mention, it's leaving a legacy for your kids and your grandkids. I mean, that's what your Bible is. It's people that journaled, they wrote their story down so that me and you, we would have faith and we would grow. And so the Holy Spirit, how he works is when we have allowed him, we've spent time with him, he's put things in us, but that's what most people's life looks like. <laughs> right? And can I tell you what most Christians are? This is all we are, collectors of knowledge. We don't apply what we're learning, but we got to get more. we got to have more. It's like a drug. we got to have a fix. we gotta, we got to have more and more, and we just throw it in the room, keep throwing it in the room. And then the Holy Spirit's like, Remember when I, I, spoke, I spoke something to you? And he knows exactly where it's at. But the problem is, this is media. This is Facebook that you scroll through for two hours. This is the videos that you like, right? This is, this is all the shows that you watch. This is all the stuff you get caught up in in life. This is your job. This is your family. It's just throwing stuff in the room, yes. Okay, so... Going back to the picture before, but hey, somebody else can ask questions other than just pastor. <laughs> thing. Just let you know. But keep it here though, because all right, because you're talking about we know the songs from the '70s and the '80s. Mm -hmm. I guarantee you that in this room we would know where that song is. Oh yeah. Okay. But I, but when you were talking, it kind of hit me. You said something. I can't remember what it was, but it's this. But what, what came to my mind was. The reason why I can remember so many songs from the '80s is, is because I can because I experienced them. Yep. I can tell you when I when when Loverboy came out with their Get Lucky album, I know I know where I, <laughs> I know where I was, and and the reason why I know those lyrics because I was cruising up and down El Dorado in Decatur, listening to it, and I can remember the experiences because that's what I did with that music. Yeah. In the Bible, Dr. George Wood said it best when he said, experience vivifies the text. We don't experience the word. We just read it. Right. And I think that is what causes this mess because we have a lot of reading. We have a lot of class taking. We have a lot of life groups. We've got a lot of conferences and all that. But did we experience anything? Right. Right. And I think that's probably the difference in, in growing is, is, that, is that God wants us to, to, you know, the reason why he wants us to meditate on that word is he wants us to experience it. You're talking about your journaling. That's how you experience it, right? Because you wrote it. That's one of the ways, yeah. Right. Yeah, correct. What you're, hey, what you're saying, listen, I'm going to tell you one of the biggest atrocities of the church in America right now because it goes exactly with that. What you said is essentially key. And listen, that's not only backed by 
his thought, like his opinion of that. Scientifically, that's backed by, by neuroscience scientists who study the brain. Most of what happens in your life, you remember experience. It's connected to an experience. Yep. If you looked at the average Christian, this is what it would look like. And this is why I'm not rushing through notes. Pastor and I, we was talking, he's like, you can teach the kingdom the rest of the year. He's like, just slow down. He's like, give people an opportunity to engage. And so that's what we're doing. So, so this is what it looks like. The average Christian, they come to church, they get a sermon on Sunday, they throw it back in the room. Right. They don't remember that. If I was to ask you guys what pastor preached two weeks ago, and I was to call you out by name, <laughs> you'd be like, it's in there somewhere, right? But you know what you can remember? And I'm going to tell you what an atrocity is here in just a second. You can remember the time that God rocked you at an altar. You know the greatest atrocity of the American church is the people quit coming to the altar. Mm -hmm. You know when revival takes place is when something dies on an altar. Right. You know why you remember your experience <laughs> at the altar? is because you left something there. You died to something there. Mm -hmm. You gave something there. And like pastor riding in his Camaro with the T-tops out and his mullet blowing in the breeze listening to <laughs> Loverboy, <laughs> Indicator, right? He links that to an experience. You know what we do, though? We come to church, we get our fix, we listen to worship, and usually why we're listening to worship, sometimes we're, we're not even there. We're, not, we're in the room, but we're not in the room. We're thinking about everything we've got to do that day, and we're checking a box and throwing something in the room. And God goes, hey, yo, I want to I encounter you today. I want you to have an experience with me today. And I'm not saying we go back to this. But when churches in America gave up Sunday nights, there was something crazy that happened where something shifted in America. You know why? Because Sunday nights was not about sermons. Sunday nights was about encounters. And people grew. And it wasn't because of a sermon. And people grew. And it wasn't because of an educational thing they were throwing in the room. They grew because Jesus was showing up at churches. But here's the thing. When you give that up, you rarely get that back. And I'm not saying from Jesus. I'm saying from people. Because then if we was to start doing that on Sunday nights again, can I tell you? You know who would show up on Sunday nights? You guys right here. You guys right here. But then the church on Sunday morning would say, Pastor, we want revival. What shapes culture? In the kingdom, the king shapes culture. And if you want his culture in you, you have to learn to die to yourself. And this is why I'm super adamant, especially if you have kids, if you have grandkids, take them to places where they can encounter Christ. Because they'll encounter him here, they'll inquire him, encounter him when they're doing their Bible study. But can I tell you, there's some places, man, where he shows up. And if you're not in the room, you miss it. And can I say, this is something we've got to be very aware of in America as people's diving Wednesday nights and they're diving uh, Sundays and they're staying at home and they're watching online. And, and I think there's a benefit to that, but there's an anointing you miss if you're not in the room. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's something you get when you sacrifice your time for Jesus. And it's not on your, your personal preference you're going, I'm going to make an attempt to be there. And so I love what you said because it's so true. Everything links back to experience and encounter. If we was to, uh, to gather with each other, oh, I will say this too. People whose lives look like this are usually the hardest people to reach. You know why? Because you start talking to them about something in the Bible, and this is what they say. I know that. But you're not doing that. <laughs> but, but I know that. I've heard that. I've, I've read that. But the problem with that is it's just in here somewhere. But if we was to shake our lives off and we was to shake all the junk out of our lives, and we was really to, to, to wane it down to kingdom in our lives, most of our lives would look like that. And that's sad. And I'm not saying everybody, but I'm saying the average Christian 
if that, their lives would look like that. Just a few books on a shelf. John 5, 19 says this. Jesus gave them this answer. Verily, he says in the King James, Verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, or verily, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the Father doing. This is how Jesus moved the kingdom culture on earth. He only did, and I mean only, capital letters, he only did what he saw his Father doing. That's it. He did not get entangled and caught up in. So what's your views on transgender? Your view doesn't matter on that. What matters is what does the Bible say on that? And it's not up for debate and it's not up for argument. Can I tell you, most people that ask you that question just want to debate with you. That's all they want to do. They really don't want the truth. So how you change truth is what Pastor said in the beginning. You spend time with people. You get to know why they think the way they think. You get to know where they went off the rail. You get to know and you get to understand the truth. And this is why things like ancient paths is so important. Because the reality is this. We live in a broken, fallen, busted up world with broken, fallen, busted up people that are hurting, that are lost. And can I tell you, some of them are us sitting in this room. And we need fixed and we need healed. And we need to know we have safe places to do that without judgment, but with truth. And that's a, a, a fine line. So the greatest tragedy on earth uh, in, in life is not death without purpose, but it's living your life with the wrong priorities. I heard somebody say one time, what a tragedy it would be if you climbed a ladder your whole life to get to the end of your life and realize you propped your ladder against the wrong wall. There's so many people, they're so busy doing good things, they're failing to do God things. And so they don't see God's authority in their life. Life's greatest challenge is knowing what to do, and the greatest mistake is being so busy that you're not effective. Life's greatest failure is to be successful in the wrong assignment in life. Can I tell you, you can make money, you can do great things on this earth that Jesus never asked you to go do because where he says in the scripture, he says, they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all of these amazing things in your name, right? Uh, Jesus he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I know you not. Did you know he's not talking to the world when he says that? He's talking to church people. God, we went to church. We cast out demons. We spoke in tongues. And he said, and it's not saying any of that's wrong, but he's saying that wasn't what I was telling you to do. Now, did he, did he tell you and I to do all those things? Yes, he did. But they were majoring on that. You see this a lot, and this is where... You got to be very careful sometimes with Pentecostal churches because there are some Pentecostal churches where you have rebellious people that go off the rails, right? And I'm not saying like, a pastor and I, we watch this. If it's somebody in there, they want to come in and just start a ministry, but they don't want to submit to anything. <coughs> we're like, not nah, here you don't. Why? Because this, order is key in the way that Jesus does things. He never blesses your chaos ever. When you come to Christ, he goes, okay, we're going to put things in order. And then when you come to Christ and he begins to open doors for you, you don't have to kick the door open. He opens doors for you. He does it in a system of order and integrity and honor and honesty. And that's the way the kingdom works. So we could go on and we can look at this, but I, I want to end with this because we just have a little bit of time left. Most of what we spend our lives praying about is what we would call Maslow's Law, right? So Maslow's Law looks like this. This is in your notes. Maslow's Law looks like this. These are the things that he discovered that uh, human beings spend their entire lives um, worrying about. So you and I... The majority of our life, 
we spend on these eight things. This is what we worry about. This is what we live our lives for, right? Water, food, clothes, housing, protection, security, pers perseverance, pre our preservation, uh, and significance. These are the things that we, we live our lives for. Now, here's the danger of that, okay? Can I tell you, 90% of what you pray about are these eight things. Yeah. I can prove this to you. Listen to you pray. And I'm not coming at you. I'm trying to teach you something tonight. I'm trying to teach you a key to the kingdom. Matthew 6.33 says this, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And 34, he says, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. If you're looking for this in your notes, it's not in your notes. He, in, in verse 34, he says, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Can I tell you what you should worry about? Nothing. Because what you can change, change. And what you can't change, you can't change. But this is what he says in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What's all these things? These things right here. How do we know that? He names them by name in that same chapter. He says, don't worry about what you'll eat. Don't worry about what you'll wear. Don't worry about what you'll drink. He goes right through this list, basically, and tells you, he says, the pagans worry about these things. So he's saying this. The pagans even pray for these things. Is it wrong to pray for them? No, but can I tell you this? You will never move to the new level of authority of your life if you can't move past just praying for these eight things. And I'm going to give you guys a challenge, and you're not going to like me, but this is your challenge for this week, okay? <laughs> I want you to take these eight things, because these are in your notes, and every time you pray, I want you to run it through the filter, is it one of these eight things? So let me show you an example, okay? Sharon Sneedon's in the hospital right now. This is how we could pray. We could pray a prayer. Lord, we ask right now that uh, you heal her eye because she has a blood clot in her eye and she's in a lot of pain right now. Amen. Right? Is, is that true? Yeah, there's truth to that. But you know what we did? We spoke that on Sharon Sneedon. Rather than... You could, go, you, could, you could say this because the Bible says he knows what you ask before you have need of it. So what a key does is a key goes, what does Scripture teach us? Is it God's will to heal? Yeah. It's scary that only like five people said that. Is it his will to heal? Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. Remember, I told you, you got to use your mouth. Uh, you got to be the loud person, right? <laughs> it is his will to heal. We know that from his word. So this is how we pray as believers with authority. God, we know it's your word to heal our sister. We thank you that you have healed our sister, and we pray that that would manifest in her body right now today. That's what we pray. You know what you're doing? Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. You want to know where I learned this? Two people, three people taught me this, actually. I learned this from Doug Carter when I first got saved. He walked in a level of authority whenever it came to healing, that was amazing. I learned this from Pastor A.B. And I mean, I learned this from Pastor A.B. I remember there was one time I was in the hospital and I was in rough shape and so rough shape that my sister had come in to see me and she was walking out into the hallway and my dad was standing in the hallway getting ready to come in. And he said, uh, my sister and my dad were, were uh, passing each other and my other sister was going in there and she said, how's he doing? And my dad said, he's going to die. And I'm in the bed. I'm like, dude, I can hear you. I'm like, I ain't going to die. I'm like, shut your mouth. I'm not dying. But I remember not long after that, I had two visitors at, at the hospital. One of them was Pastor A.B. And he walked in, and I was like, hey. And he said, shut up, literally. And he came straight to my bed, and he began to speak the word over my life. He spoke truth. He literally was taking keys and he was unlocking things over me and he was locking things up over me. And can I tell you, things started changing in my life. And then there was another couple that came to visit me and it was Judge and Judy. And they had a list of scriptures that they gave me and I still have those. You know what those were? They were keys. They were saying, do not speak how you feel. Don't speak what is your opinion. Go to God with what is true. 
Speak to him what is true. And can I tell you, we all need to remind it of this from time to time. And so when you're on the couch and you're like, oh, I got a headache, it's killing me. You know what you're speaking over yourself? Death. You may feel that way, but that's not truth. And, and I don't mean it's not true that you don't have a headache. Listen to me. What's true is this. My God is a healer. My God is a redeemer. My God has called me, equipped me, and qualified me. Yesterday, so my son, he's been real sick at home. And yesterday, right? So this is how the enemy works, right? My son's been fighting strep throat. I got this tickle in my throat. I was like, oh, no. And then all of a sudden, the Lord's like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm not getting sick. I'm walking in health because I walk in the favor and the healing of the Lord. And can I tell you? I'm perfectly fine. But your mind plays a huge part in the battle of what you do. The biggest warfare you'll ever have in your life is between your ears. And the biggest enemy you'll have in your life is what comes out of your mouth. It will bless you or it will curse you. And that is scripture, y'all. All right, so... This is what I'm going to ask. Is there anybody brave enough and bold enough to pray us out tonight? <laughs> that, that, will, that will bless us tonight. If not, I'm going to call somebody. Because I, I, I know somebody that I can count on. Anybody? Thanks, Carol. Heavenly Father, we thank you immensely for what we've heard tonight. And Father, we appreciate knowing that we have keys to the kingdom, keys that will unlock doors and keys that will lock them back when they need, when they need to be locked back. And Father, I pray for each person that's in this room tonight that they will step out of here with more faith than what they came in, yes. knowing that we are children of the kingdom. And Father, teach us how to pray kingdom prayer. Mm -hmm. Show us. Let us not just say, say the same prayers we've always said over and over again, but teach us to speak truth yeah. into each other's lives. Yes. Give us the ability to encourage one another in kingdom principles. And Father, we thank you for Pastor Don and what he means to us and how he's equipping us to be children of the king. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.